Welcome to week 11. We are talking about the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That's an important statement. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Grace and peace to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad that you're with us. We've been working our way through the Beatitudes. And remember, let's, let's always go back and reset the table. The Beatitudes, in the Beatitudes, Jesus is not prescribing behavior for the kingdom to get you into the kingdom or how you are supposed to act. He's describing. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. He's describing what life in the kingdom looks like. And life in the kingdom of God, when you're fully invested, fully integrated into the kingdom, you are going to live as a peacemaker. So we're going to tease out today what is the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. I'm going to add, matter of fact, I'll start off with three questions. Number the first question is, and the way I asked this originally with the men, I said, do you have to be peaceful, full of peace? to be a peacemaker. But I reworded that to ask it this way. Do you have to be peaceful, full of peace, to be compelled to be a peacemaker? Do you have to be full of peace, overflowing with peace, peaceful, to be compelled to be a peacemaker? Which we will tease that out. The second question is, what is the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker? And we'll tease that question out. The third question I want you to actually think about answering right now, what was Jesus a peacemaker? Was he a peacemaker? I think our typical response would be to say, yes, of course, Jesus was a peacemaker. He was a prince of peace. But Jesus himself said in Matthew 10, I have not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. That's a misunderstood passage. What he means by that is, by, by my coming, it will be it will be a division between families. There will be husbands who follow me and wives who do not. And there'll be wives who follow me and husbands that do not. And there'll be families that part some do and some don't. And it's going, going to create conflict and it's going to create a division. He said, I not, did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. Because when we surrender our lives to follow Jesus and step into the kingdom, it's a different life. And it is going to cause conflict. So perhaps Jesus was a peacemaker, but I like to think in terms of Jesus was a peace creator. And what I want to do today is, is walk us to, uh, through a process of how do we become peacemakers? How do we become compelled to want to go out and make peace with those around us? And then we'll tease out in what various aspects we're going to talk about. We'll do that in just a moment. But what I want to start with is Jesus creates peace in us. There's no other source for peace in us. You can get fleeting peace, sitting out on the beach, really chilling out, just getting in your favorite place. And I went to the Abacos 20 years ago, and I spent 14 days down there in the, in the Bahamas. It was incredible. No phones, no cars. And I had, the, I had this unbelievable peace which was completely gone when I got cell service. All the calls, all the things that weren't going right back on the construction projects, completely shattered. It was a very temporary peace. But Jesus in John 14 in his last night with his disciples said, the peace I'm leaving with you, the peace I'm giving you, it's not as the world gives. It's not sitting out on a beach or reading a book or being chilled out or being so, everything in your life being just right. No, the peace I leave with you, the peace I'm giving you, that is a permanent peace. If you will just receive it and live it, it's a permanent peace. You will not find peace anywhere else in this world, my friend. And, and is it an is it a overstatement to say that addictions, bad behavior in general come because we're seeking peace? We've got a hole inside and we're trying to find peace. See, I maintain that, that every decision you make, if you could drill down to the very root core of that decision, you were seeking peace. You may have thought more money could bring you peace. You may have thought that woman or that man could bring you peace. You may have thought that job or that trip or that car or that house, whatever it was, you may have thought that could bring you peace. Of course, it would not, not unless Jesus is the one giving, it's not unless he is the source of the peace. 
if he is giving you and leaving with you and you are receiving and learning to live with his peace, it's the only peace around. Everything else is just a mirage. So addictions, over excessive behavior, we're trying to find peace and we're looking in all the wrong places. Jesus is the only one that can give us this peace. And then he, but in his Beatitudes, he says, now in the light, in the kingdom, I want you to be peacemakers. Living in the kingdom is all about being peacemakers. So let's sort of build this step by step to, to being so full of peace, to being in such a peaceful state in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, that I'm compelled to be a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper, but a peacemaker, a peacemaker with others and my heavenly father, others that I don't think really know my heavenly father, don't know Jesus as I know him. I'm, I'm compelled to try to bring them into a peaceful state with Jesus. When I see two others in conflict, I'm compelled to try to help them sort it out and find peace. When I'm in conflict with someone, someone else is in conflict with me, I'm compelled to try to resolve it. So let's walk through this. I'm going to start with this passage from Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, Jesus is talking, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. That sounds a whole lot like for they shall be called children of God, doesn't it? Praying for, loving those who don't like you, who persecute you, who insult you, who think ill of you. That sounds a lot like being a peacemaker. And in both instances, Jesus says that you may be sons, daughters of your father in heaven, that you may be, shall be called children of God. It seems that our heavenly father, when he looks down and he sees us seeking to be peacemakers, he says, that's my boy. I'm so proud of him. Look at my girl. Look at my daughter. I'm so proud of her. She's actually seeking to be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper. Why is this so important? In John 17, in Jesus's high priestly prayer, this is what we ought to call the Lord's Prayer. The, the Lord's Prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer should really be the disciples' prayer. This was Jesus's prayer. In John 17, he's praying first for himself with, with his heavenly Father, then for his disciples, and then he gets to praying for us. And I'll pick it up in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also that though, for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and me. That all of them may be one, Father. That all of them may be one. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, listen, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our unity, our being one, is a sign to the world that Jesus is real. And if you think about the way the world must view the Christian church with all the splits and all the animosity and all the problems, all the bickering, all the disagreements, they must look and say, well, that, that's not even close. I think it was Gandhi who, said, who looked at Christianity and said, you know, I like Christianity, I like Jesus, but not those Christians. Being a peacemaker, is an important role in the kingdom of God. I was listening to a speaker talk about phantom pain, and he was, he was using this in relation to our topic today. Phantom pain, we all know what that is. Someone, a soldier, or someone in an accident, or someone with an illness through surgery loses a limb. And that person can experience pain in that limb that they no longer have. They can actually experience real pain in a limb that they no longer have. And his point was, they had to have had the limb first and lost it to experience phantom pain. They had to have had the limb and lost it to experience phantom pain. And he took, it, took us back to the Garden of Eden where, where in the beginning, God created a relational and physical paradise, a relational and physical paradise, full of peace, peaceful, but that's gone. But we all carry in us a phantom pain for that peace. We're all seeking peace. Just give me some peace around me, outside of me, around me. And then give me some peace inside. That's what I want so badly. That's what you want. It's peace. 
We have a phantom pain. People talk about world peace. There's never been world peace. Why would anybody talk about world peace? Because we have phantom pain for what we lost in the garden and we want it back. And Jesus said, well, I have it for you. I can give it to you and I can leave it with you. But it's going to be up to us to actually live it out. The Hebrew word shalom, most of us, when we hear shalom, we hear peace. And that is true, but in a very shallow way, shalom really carries with it a huge thrust, far more, far greater than just absence of danger or absence of conflict. It is a fullness. It is a completeness. It is harmony, balance, everything that would bring life to the full. That Hebrew word shalom is packed with dynamite, with power. But the Greek word for peace, it's, it's, I'm going to spell it for you. It's E-I-R-E-N-E, -E, Irene. And that's where we get our English word serene. And in the Greek, one of the meanings for this word Irene is to pull together. And it's interesting that the Greek word for anxiety means to pull apart. And you just think about it. When you're full of anxiety, you are pulled apart. But this Greek word is our, our root for our word serene. And when it comes to man and man or man and God, it means to join together. So as we walk through this, we're going to blow this word peace up into becoming something that we are so full of that we are overflowing with it. And that is my real point. And I've struggled with teaching this this week because it's not an easy way to, to it's not an easy topic. It's hard to convey this. So ask the Holy Spirit, as I am asking him now, to help you receive this message from him. And let me just be the person that brings it as, as, uh, as short of perfection as I may bring it. Let's think about this. Which of the Beatitudes, because we're almost at the end of the Beatitudes, which of the Beatitudes are necessary or helpful for you to be a peacemaker? Now, remember, we've talked about poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart. Which of those will be helpful in being a peacemaker? Well, if you start looking at them individually, you would, you would come to the conclusion, all of them. And I don't think it's an accident that Jesus is building his case as he goes through the Beatitudes, placing this where he places it, because we're going to need to be humble in our hearts. We're going to need to have that meekness, that strength under control. We're going to need to mourn people who are in conflict. We're going to need to hunger and thirst for right relationships, viscerally. But we're going to have to be merciful. And we're going to have, we can't, we have to be pure in heart in the sense we cannot have any hidden agendas, any ulterior motives. Anyone you're trying to help resolve the conflict, resolve anxiety, bring back peace, is going to see right through any hidden agenda that you have. So I, I want to talk for a minute about how we can be full of peace and the go to passage. And I'm going to bring this up with a screen share. The go to passage is Philippians 4. You may want to pull it up in your Bible. Here we are at Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice. Be joyful. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. You live in the kingdom. You have a king with this kingdom who is perfectly present, perfectly powerful, perfectly loving. Therefore, rejoice. Be joyful. When, when, when the Holy Spirit through Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, be joyful always. Can we be joyful? Is that, is that a choice? You might think it's just a feeling, but no, it is a choice. And we're going to walk through this all important passage to see how we can choose to be joyful, which then brings us peace. Rejoice, be joyful in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all that. That let your gentleness be evident at all. Doesn't that sound a lot like the Beatitudes? The Lord is near. You live in the kingdom. Do not be anxious. Do not be pulled apart by anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. 
prayer and petition. Don't be, do not be anxious about it. Bring it to your heavenly father. Prayer would be that conversational relationship with your heavenly father. Petition is asking him for things. We are called to lay it all out there. But then the Holy Spirit through Paul slips in this with thanksgiving. What does he mean by that? I'm bringing the things to my heavenly father that concern me, that I'm asking him to get involved with. Not that I have to ask him. He's already involved, but I'm asking that. I'm bringing that in my prayers. I'm bringing in my petitions. But with thanksgiving. And herein lies this little habit that I've picked up over the last few years that has changed everything. And I've shared it with you before, but you need to hear it again. Thank you now, Father, before I see how you work this out, because I know I'll be thanking you later. Thank you now, Father, before I see how you work this out, because I will be thanking you later. Whenever I say this, I will have someone say, well, that might not be in this lifetime, but my experience has been, it's always been in this lifetime. I'm certain there are, I assume there are some cases where you might not be able to thank him until you get on the other side of glory, but it has not been my experience. I can always, I will always be thanking him. So when I bring these requests, before I even finish. I said, no, I want to thank you now. You remember last week in our video on gratitude, Jesus in John 11, when he's getting ready to call Lazarus out of the tomb, Lazarus has been dead for four days. He says, I thank you, Father, that you heard me. And then he says, I know you always hear me. I just said that for these folks, so they would know that you always hear me, and therefore they would know that you always hear them. There is nothing in scripture where Jesus makes any excuse or any idea, any talk about God not answering prayers, not responding to prayers. Yes, the thank you is, I know you're going to respond. I know you already are responding. And now my peace starts to grow naturally. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. If you ask me, what does peace mean? I would say, well, the truth is, if I try to define it, I'm going to fall short. It transcends all understanding. But I know it when I have it. And I know it when I lose it. And I know you do too. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That Greek word in guard is garrison. Peace becomes a garrison, a protective fort against the outside pressures of this world. And this is how we start becoming peaceful, so full of peace that we're overflowing. And we've developed an aversion for anything that is non-peaceful, anything that is anti-peace, anything that is causing conflict. We want to correct it. We're compelled to because we're so full of peace. In my old days, the old Sam, I was so wrought up about everything. I wouldn't know when I was peaceful or not peaceful. Matter of fact, the only time I was peaceful was when I was able to carve out some little piece of peace by where I was, what I was doing, what I was drinking, whatever it was. It was, it was just a piece. But I didn't have any idea about what it would be like to be so full of peace that I've now developed an aversion for anything that attacks that peace. I'm overflowing with it. Someone was telling me just recently that they are 10% full of peace and 90% full of anxiety. I said, well, I certainly used to be that way. As a matter of fact, I may have been 100% full of anxiety, but I am now 90% full of peace. I am. And you can be too. Peaceful. Now, how do we be joyful? Verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Let your mind focus on these things. Life in the kingdom. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. You see, two or three weeks ago, we talked about being pure in heart and we talked about setting up guardrails to protect your heart from from the pollution of the world, the dirt in the carburetor of the world, the sloppy or sinful stuff to, to to have guardrails that if there's a habit you've had, you just have not been successful in defeating. If there's an addiction, if there's whether it be sloppy or sinful, 
you set up guardrails. Well, I want to maintain that peace is the ultimate guardrail. Peace is the ultimate guardrail. Look at this little graph I put together. Isn't it great? This is, you're inside this, this garrison, and it's a garrison of peace. And it is fighting off insults, temptations, troubles, how will I questions, what if questions, lust, anger, anxiety, fear. It's fighting all of those off. You have a garrison of peace. Your hearts and your minds are, are guarded by this peace that you have, this peace that you have with your Heavenly Father, this peace that you have with others, this peace that you have with yourself, and this peace that you have with creation. Remember when we talked about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, said that a very helpful way to think of in terms of righteousness is being in a right relationship with God, with others, with yourself, and with creation, God's beloved creation. Well, it plays right into this whole idea of being a peace, being full of peace. My relationship with my Heavenly Father, I'm at peace with Him through Jesus and only through Jesus. I'm typically at peace with others. I'm typically at peace with myself. And I'm typically at peace with creation because I know He loves creation and I do too. And I'm so sensitive to this peaceful condition that when I'm getting out of whack, then I take measures to, to get back into harmony, get back into balance. You can live this kind of peaceful life. You can have this. When you present your request to God, you thank him beforehand, trusting that he is near, he is present, and he will take care of, your, of you and these things that you're worried about. And you will be thanking him later. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will build a garrison around your heart and your mind. Now, what I've been trying to do is take a step by step to how we then become peacemakers, because there is a difference between being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. I have developed, because of the peaceful heart that I have, an aversion to anything contra peace. So when I think about being a peacemaker with God and others, I have, of course, I'm in the business of representing Jesus and introducing people to Jesus, and I'm compelled to do this. I'm compelled to do it because I want you to know him as I have become, as I have come to know him and am becoming to more and more know him. I want you to have that experience. He's the greatest friend you'll ever have. Yes, he's, an, he's, a, he's God Almighty, he's Savior, he's my Savior, he's my Lord, but he's also the best friend I could ever have, and I want you to know him that way. I want you to know God as my Heavenly Father, not as God, and Jesus was compelled that way. You can see over and over that Jesus is saying, you don't know God as my Heavenly Father. I want you to know him. So when I, I see folks that don't understand who God is, they know God maybe a God of wrath or God of rules. I want, to, I want to get involved and help them to find peace with that God so that he becomes their heavenly father. If they think Jesus, if they, if they don't know Jesus, I want them to know him because I know that's where the peace of life is. When I see others in conflict, a brother and a sister or a brother and a brother, I want to help resolve that because I just don't want to see them in that conflict. When I'm in conflict with someone else, and this is really where the rubber hits the road, when I'm in conflict with someone else, even if it's their fault, I'm compelled, I'm motivated, I'm driven to try to resolve it with them. Years ago, a man who was a little bit younger than I, who, who thought I was thought of me as, as a big brother in Jesus, that I helped him find Jesus, whether he found Jesus or not, I'm not sure, but that's the way he talked. And then I, over a period of a year or so, I ran into him three or four times. We didn't see each other often. I ran him three or four times, and he was very short and brief with me. He wasn't rude, really, but he just was kind of cold, which was very unlike our relationship. He would hug me anytime I saw him and speak effusively about how I'd helped him, which may or may not be true, but, but there was suddenly a change. 
And about the fourth or fifth time, I realized there is something wrong in our relationship. Now, I thought, I speculated on what it was. And it would have been a complete misunderstanding. And I would not have done what he thought I had done. I did not do what he thought I had done. So, you know, my natural self outside the kingdom was, so? I don't need him. And who is he to talk to me that way? Or who is he to be cold to me or treat me this way? After all I've done for him. No, I don't need that. I'll just move on. But the Holy Spirit kept nagging at my heart and tugging and saying, be a peacemaker. Reach out. And what would it take for me to do that? Well, it would take all those beatitudes we talked about. It would take humility, meekness, mercy, poor in spirit, recognizing my own spiritual poverty hungering and thirsting viscerally for right relationships. So I called him. I, I knew he wouldn't answer the phone, but I left him a voicemail and I said, if I have done something to offend you, I would like the opportunity to apologize and make it right. As a matter of fact, I, even on this voicemail, I'll ask your forgiveness. Now, I want you to know that I did not feel like I'd done anything wrong, but that's the way I started. And then I said, and if there is something that you think I did, that maybe I didn't do, I'd like the opportunity to clear it up because I want to restore our relationship. Now, he didn't call me back, but I was, I was compelled to do that. Surely, there is someone in your life that your Heavenly Father is looking to you to be the peacemaker, to not just sit still and not just necessarily forgive them, but to actually restore the relationship. Surely, there is someone. Now, I want to finish with a few, few scripture passages. Well, first, yeah, you know, let's just go back and I, I will, I'll pull this up over here on the right. Peaceful is the first step. To be full of peace is the first step. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Rule in your heart. Reign in your heart so that anything that comes into your heart that is attacking that peace is immediately counterattack is pushed away let the peace of christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to be to peace and be thankful holy spirit keeps sliding in that be thankful doesn't he peaceful is the first step peacekeeper is the next step being a peacekeeper is the next step ephesians 4 3 make every effort make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace Romans 8, 12, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible. One of the men in the Lawrence group said, I, I want to flip flop that and say, as far as it depends on me, when it is possible, live at peace with everyone. Peaceful is the first step. Peacekeeper is the next step. Peacemaker is the big step. Peacemaker is the big step. James 3.18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of right relationships. My friend, life in the kingdom is all about being so full of peace because I live in a kingdom that is governed by an all-powerful king. So I'm perfectly safe in the kingdom. An all-loving king who is going to take care of me and a perfectly present king who is always around and knows everything that's going on in my life. So I fill up with his peace to the point where I overflow and I want to be sure other people have that same peace with my heavenly father, with each other, with me and with his creation. Peacemakers, peacemakers in the kingdom shall be called children of God. Thank you. I'll, next week, next week, we will finish up the Beatitudes with those when you're being persecuted there. Yours is the kingdom of heaven is not will be not shall be is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Grace and peace be with you, my friends.